Ana Frank já está na primeira cadeira aqui do palco. E eu faço questão, porque a Ana Frank perguntou, você tá bravo comigo? Jamais, Ana Frank. Eu te amo. Jamais estarei bravo com você. Você mora no meu coração. Desde o dia que você foi levar pão de queijo na CPUI para mim, em cima do palco, primeira Campus Party em Minas Gerais. Hashtag fica a dica aí, tá, pessoal? CPUI. Bom, vamos lá. Muito feliz em apresentar essa pessoa. Eu fiz uh, um call com ela de alinhamento antes. E é uma pessoa muito adorável, muito amável, além de super inteligente. E que já nos brindou com a presença do seu pai na edição espanhola da Campus Party. Ladies and gentlemen, Lucy Hawking. Oh! Right. Good evening, Campus Party. And thank you so much for having me here this evening. It is a great honor to be asked to talk to you. I'm here following in the tracks of my father, the dear and great late Stephen Hawking, who spoke to Campus Party over 10 years ago, but he never got to come to Sao Paulo, this amazing, fabulous and vibrant city. Thank you so much for the welcome. I am here tonight to talk to you about the legacy of my father, about the future, about how we make that a place we want to visit. And so I'd like to start you with a quote from him. It's a very famous quote. You'll see it all over the internet. But it really was, these are really his words. And he said, look up at the stars, not down at your feet. Try to make sense of what you see and wonder about what makes the universe exist. Be curious. And what he means with this, he means he wants us to put aside our everyday assumptions. He wants us to think differently about who we are, about what we do. Because he wanted us to ask big questions about the universe, about ourselves, about any other topic. But he wanted us to do it in a way that he called unbounded by the prejudice of common sense. So in my case, that means thinking differently about how we talk about science and technology, how we reach out to a wider world who may not think they're interested, they may not care, They may be suspicious or even actually fearful. You see, my father Stephen had this great gift. He could talk about the most abstract scientific topic and everybody would listen. He could make people care. He could make it relevant to the lives of everyday people. He could bring the humor and the emotion that made science real for an incredibly diverse selection of people. So tonight, I want to think a bit about how. Why does this matter? What did I learn in 15 years of working with him? I am his most prolific co-author. Together we wrote over seven books and I've done a host of other projects in science communication. And so I want to share some of that with you this evening. Share what I learned from the world's greatest science communicator. Because you are brilliant. You have the potential to change the future. Your ideas, your products, your innovations, these are going to rewrite the source code of the world. And that, to me, is so impressive and worthwhile. I, on the other hand, come from a humanities background. I'm an artist who works with scientific information as my raw material. And I've done all sorts of different projects, 
You can see some of my books here. George's Secret Key to the Universe, Fantasy Adventure for Young Readers, where all the science is real science. Princess Olivia, silly, quirky, funny, madcap story that helps young minds to connect with climate science. The Space Diaries, these are books that you can use in education so that kids can write their own story about their own journey into space. They support kids to do their own scientific research, use a creative imagination, and take themselves into space. And so they end up with their own book. I worked in lots of different media. This is a still from a virtual reality film I made called The Party. And when you watch The Party, you, the viewer, go into the perception of a 14-year-old girl with autism in a social setting she can't cope with. So the abstract scientific information here is about visual processing in the condition of autism. But because you get to experience it, you learn something on an emotional and an intuitive level about what it is like to have the condition of autism. And yes, you could find all this information in books or in articles or in scientific, medical, neurological papers, but this is a way for people to enter into a very misunderstood condition and experience it from the inside. And I've worked on museum exhibits, I've worked on documentaries, on podcasts. I've done so many different types of work, but they all feature storytelling. Because I believe that storytelling has the ability to unlock other worlds for people. And I'm talking about that this evening in the context of science and technology. I'm talking about how you can use storytelling in your work, how you can create that kind of engagement, that relevance, that emotional reaction for whatever it is you go away from here to do. Because you can't change the world unless you can engage with it. So, here we are. Here is what I learned. Number one, be open to inspiration. You never know when it's going to strike you. You can't predict it. You can't buy it. You can't force it or manufacture it. It's just a spark of something that if you're very lucky, will come to you one day. And if it does, I want you to act on it. I want you to take however crazy the idea seems, however out there, however much everyone around you says, what? I want you to take it seriously. Here's a nice story about inspiration. In 1970, my father, he's still quite a young man. He's a working scientist. He has two young children. He already has motor neurone disease. One night, oh, um, I should say, I am that baby. One night, um, just he was going to bed, he had what he called a eureka moment. He had like a vision, the divine spark, it hit him. And he was like, I've realized something. And immediately he sat down to work on it. He didn't let it slip away. He didn't let it become a weird dream, tangled up with nappy changing and feeding babies and, and, and teaching students. What he did instead was he worked out a very elegant mathematical proof of what happens when two black holes collide. Now, this was pretty out there in terms of science content for the 1970s. I imagine that some of his colleagues did say, all right, Stephen, are you sure? Okay. But 30 years later, LIGO, the gravitational wave experiment, detected gravitational waves coming from colliding black holes and proved that the predictions of his theory were correct. Now, 
in a less cosmic sense, I was with my father one day. It was my son's birthday party. Usual chaos, relatives, cake, crying children, bouncy castle. When a small boy came up to my father and said, Stephen, what would happen to me if I fell in a black hole? And my father said, you would be turned into spaghetti. And all the kids were super excited. They loved this. They wanted to know what would happen when they fell in a black hole. And they understood the answer because it came from something they related to, something from their world, spaghetti. And at that moment, even in all that unlikely chaos of a young children's birthday party, I realized that something important had happened. The kids had asked a question my father had given a brilliant answer, but that this was a story. That there was a story here about how would a child fall in a black hole. And I said to my father, this is what we should do. We should write a fantasy adventure story about kids traveling around space. And there'll be two of them and they'll go through a computerized portal and they'll fly around on a comet as you see them here in this illustration. And at the time, people said, no, this is not right. This is not how we should teach science to children. There were textbooks and sci-fi, but there was a lot of resistance to the idea of a high-level scientist such as my father talking to young kids in terms that they would understand. But George's Secret Key came out in 2007. Uh, it has not been out of print since then. It's sold over a million copies. It's in over 40 languages. So that moment of inspiration changed my life. At that time, I was an unemployed single mother of an autistic child. And yet, I had an idea. I had a moment of inspiration, acted on it, and I have never looked back. So. If you are lucky enough to have that spark of inspiration, please take it seriously, act on it, because you will not only change your life, but you may change the lives of countless numbers of people around the world. Now, be clear. This is what science communication looks like to a lot of people. When I first started working with a lot of scientists to write from kids, I found that many of them would say to me, everyone will know that. And I would have to say, no, everyone does not know that. That is a complicated concept that is outside of general knowledge. And so I would say to them, I want you to give a clear, accessible explanation in terms that your readership, your audience, will understand. Now, my father, of course, turned out to be brilliant at this. He once asked me why I had written the term orbit when he thought go round would suit the readership better. Um, but it is difficult. It can be difficult to have that clarity, to understand that you can talk to people on their own terms. But it is really important there used to be a feeling that science communication could inspire through mystification. And scientists would say very, very clever things and people would nod their heads because they were afraid of looking stupid if they didn't understand. But I think the world has moved on from there and clarity is important. Explanations are important. You don't need to patronize your audience but you do need to let them have a way in to what you're talking about. At the same time, I would like you to be careful about oversimplification. Clarity for me is about accessibility, it's about inclusivity, it's about saying we can all join in, we can all understand this. Oversimplification to me means taking a very complicated concept, stripping it of meaning and reducing it to a soundbite 
Let me give you an example. Take back control. This refers to the very complicated process of the United Kingdom leaving the European Union, summed up in three words, take back control, which turned out, I don't want to give away too much of my politics here, turned out not to mean very much in the end. Now, engage emotionally. The science and tech worlds thrive on rationality, on logic, on data, on evidence. And that is, of course, completely correct. This is the lifeblood of these. This is the, the beating heart of the science world. But, but I'm talking to you tonight about communicating with a wider world communicating outside of the worlds of science and technology, outside of the worlds of academia and professional science and industry. We're talking about taking what you do, taking your ideas, taking them out to the general public, whether they be young or old, whether they agree or disagree with you. And I saw a quote which summed this up for me. A writer said, the war against climate change will not be won with infographics. The point the author is making is that when scientists are challenged, they tend to double down on rationality. They tend to double down on evidence. And they don't think about how can I draw this person in. They construct an argument as though you're talking to another scientist. But as I said, we're talking about wide, the widest possible, the most inclusive style of communication here. And the problem is that if you make your case using statistics and abstract concepts, rather than simple imagery and emotion, if you rely on the enlightenment fallacy, this idea that the facts speak for themselves, that truth will prevail, you may find you run into unexpected complications. Now, conspiracy theories have been with us for a very long time. They are nothing new, but they are constructed in a completely different way to the tenets of science communication. This is an example of where storytelling is used for a dark purpose. Conspiracy theories can actually draw on the worlds of film, of television, um, gaming in particular. They can be narratively quite brilliant. They can place you right at the center of things, make you feel like you're in charge of what you're consuming. They can even guide you so you feel like you're doing your own research, coming to your own conclusions. Now, I'm not asking you to structure your public communication in the manner of a conspiracy theory, but it is worth you looking at them. How is it that they place a hook into their audience? How is it that they ping off all the emotions and they suck people in? The problem is that we face enormous global challenges at the moment. And this quote is from a PR expert who works with progressive causes. And he is trying to get them to use storytelling, to use these language of emotions in the content that we put out there about climate change in order to help everyday people understand the impacts on them, to get away from the abstraction the statistics. You see, for a lot of people, science is quite scary. Um, I use this image when I talk to kids to ask them, who gets to be a scientist? Do you need to be a crazy man in a white coat doing an experiment all by yourself? And this image of science and scientists. We see it a lot, even up to the modern day, even in the last James Bond film, there was still a dangerous scientist who had to be stopped in order for the world to be saved, an order to prevail. 
And the problem with this, the, one of the many problems with this, is that this breeds fear. And fear is the most toxic of emotions. And of course, if you are afraid, it is impossible to learn. So how do we break down fear? Well, humor is a good start. This is my father in The Simpsons in the 1990s. This simple image is a piece of genius. At that time, science was not funny. Nobody thought science was funny. Scientists didn't tell jokes. Well, they did between themselves, but not in the public sphere. They didn't want to break down that distance. And when my father went in The Simpsons, a lot of his colleagues really looked down on him like, oh, Stephen, but he didn't care. He just didn't care. He thought this was great. He was beamed into millions of homes, watched by teenagers, having a laugh with the Simpson family. At the end of this episode, he goes to the pub with Homer Simpson, where Homer tells him, so the world's stupidest man and the world's cleverest man, go to the pub for a beer together so that Homer can tell my father about his theory of a donut-shaped universe. And it just changes the frame of who gets to be a scientist. If a scientist is somewhere that Homer Simpson can have a beer with, we're already starting to change the conversation. This is a still from an animation that I made, and I use it with kids. I'm trying to get them to think about how do they want technology to come into their lives? What are their emotional reactions to robots? That's what this is about. And the question is, would you like a robot to cut your hair, clean your teeth, and read you a story? And the answer is always no. Um, although most kids are quite keen on robots doing their homework and walking their dog. Now, point four, relatability. When I first started working in science education, there was a level of global anxiety about the fact that children in education were not engaging with science. They were turning away from it, and people were trying to work out why is this happening. Um, and one of the reasons seemed to be this lack of relatability that science was taught in a way that had no relationship to school children's experience of life. So instead of starting with an accessible, overarching concept like, what would happen to me if I fell in a black hole? Or why do I look like my parents? It was the other way around. They had to learn a lot of abstract material, didn't really make sense to them. They had no sense of anticipation about a kind of unfolding narrative. And I think for school children and education, you can always put in the general population because I think that was very much the feeling that this contextual link of the importance of science for society was not being stressed. People were not being given a way to understand how science and society go hand in hand. What is the relevance? What is the context? How does your idea speak to current concerns? How does it address a community, an individual need? How can people relate to what it is you propose? Because it's that relationship, that ability to relate that helps us all as humans to process. Now, my father, needless to say, was also great at this. And this is actually one of my favorite of his quotes. So he's talking about the discovery of Hawking radiation. This idea that black holes are not entirely black. That before him, we thought of black holes as an internal prison from which nothing would ever escape. So if you fell in, that, was, that, would, be, that would be it. But Hawking radiation shows that black holes emit a simple thermal radiation. So that's why he's saying they're not as black as they've been painted. And so he goes on to say, if you find yourself in a dark place, don't despair. There's always a way out. So at the same time, he's talking about Hawking radiation, 
the fact that thermal radiation is being emitted from a black hole, but he's also telling you something about his experience of life. He's saying that he, as a person with a profound disability, has felt despair, has considered giving up, but has also realized that there is always a way out. And so this, as a simple statement that encapsulates science and the relatability of an experience that is so human to all of us, that feeling like, I can't go on, it's too much, things will never get better. There you are, he summed them both up in three sentences. Now, this is my penultimate point, be yourself. The Oracle of Delphi, Hamlet Shakespeare, will tell you the same thing, and so will Taylor Swift. So this is not really something you need me to tell you, but I want you to think about it in context of science and technology, because there's been this divide, this idea that science, the cognitive domain, logical, data-driven, no emotional content, no personal experience, that somehow personal experience detracts from the purity of endeavor, of scientific endeavor. But here's the thing. I gave a talk a couple of months ago, which didn't go very well. And the reason I felt at the end that it had not gone well is because I had presented an inauthentic version of myself. I had gone out to try and justify everything I had done as though every idea, every project I had done was somehow inspired by a piece of academic research which showed I was right, which is simply not true. I have done what I thought was interesting, what I hoped would work, what I hoped people would relate to, and then if there has been research or data points, then that's been very interesting to help me refine my practice and improve what I do. But I tried to present a kind of super academic, non version of myself, and I just didn't connect with anybody. So you are brilliant, young people. And already in your lives, you have made so many choices that have led you to be where you are, to do what you do, to think about what you think. And I want you to try and just understand them. Understand your own journey through life. Understand what authenticates you and what you do. Not because you need to overshare or give everyone your autobiography, but just that sense of inner confidence that you understand yourself, why you do what you do, why it matters, and why you feel you need to share it with the world, because this will help you to connect. It will help to heal this divide that we see between science, academia on one side, general population, non-specialists on the other side. Because it's really important what you do, what you propose, your ideas, your futures are all our futures. And we want you to be hugely successful and we want you to engage with the world so that you can help change it. So, on that note, keep trying. My father is very big on this. Never give up. It is not an easy world out there. We all face challenges, rejection, knocks, difficult moments, lack of confidence, but keep trying. And just to round us out, it wouldn't be the same if I didn't play you something from my father. So if you want to know why does all this matter, here he is set to the music of Vangelis, a message that after he died, we broadcast from a radio telescope towards a black hole. Here it is. I am very aware of the preciousness of time. Seize the moment. Act now. I have spent my life traveling across the universe inside my mind. Through 
theoretical physics, I have sought to answer some of the great questions. But there are other challenges, other big questions which must be answered, and these will also need a new generation who are interested, engaged, and with an understanding of science. How will we feed an ever-growing population? Provide clean water, generate renewable energy, prevent and cure disease, and slow down global climate change. I hope that science and technology will provide the answers to these questions, but it will take people, human beings with knowledge and understanding, to implement these solutions. One of the great revelations of the space age has been the perspective it has given humanity on ourselves. When we see the Earth from space, we see ourselves as a whole. We see the unity and not the divisions. It is such a simple image. With a compelling message, one planet, one human race. We are here together, and we need to live together, with tolerance and respect. We must become global citizens. I have been enormously privileged, through my work, to be able to contribute to our understanding of the universe. But it would be an empty universe indeed, if it were not for the people I love, and who love me. We are all time travelers, turning together into the future. But let us work together to make that future, a place we want to visit. Be brave, be determined, overcome the odds. It can be done. So it, uh, thank you. <laughs> so it just remains for me to say thank you. Thank you for listening and good luck on all your cosmic journeys and don't fly too close to a black hole. Give yourselves a very big hand. Oi gente, boa noite, tudo bem? Eu sou Lucas Agrela, sou repórter do Estadão e vou aqui mediar as perguntas e respostas. Vocês podem perguntar em português, eu traduzo para ela aqui se for o caso, tá bom? Se quiser perguntar em inglês também, fiquem à vontade. Quem começa? Sorry. Alô, alô. Só uma... Uma coisa, quando vocês levantarem a mão, mantenham ela levantada, tá? Uh, hello? Lucy, over here, in the middle. Oh, in the middle. hi, sorry, there you are. Yeah, I don't, uh, okay, uh, first of all, uh, good evening, okay? Good evening. You are beautiful, thank, thank you, you for presenting oh, thank you. all of this for us. I wanted to ask you, being uh, the daughter of like one of the greatest scientists that ever lived, uh, what, what made you decide to take this course of action in your career? Because you know, I, know, I want to understand, you grew up with you know, such an amazing scientist around, and you looked at that and said, this needs better storytelling, it needs a touch of artistry. Well, thank you, that's a very good question. I think you've almost answered it yourself. Um, I could tell that there was a problem in the way science was being communicated. That people were going to science lectures and nodding, and then afterwards, if you said, well, what did you learn from that? They were like, oh, I don't know, but it was amazing. And I just thought maybe there's a way of making science more accessible right from an early age, right from that 
entry level, where kids are so excited about the world and they have all these why questions and they want to know all these things, but then nobody answers them in a way that they can relate to. And then when they grow up, they think, oh, well, no one gave me answers, so they go and do something else. And I just thought, my father was so iconic. He was so funny and so friendly. And I thought that this was something he could do, which would be a really positive legacy to show all kids that they could understand and they could be part of the amazing world of science. Okay, thank you. Thank you for being such a big inspiration. Oh, thank you. Hello, Lucy. I'm Hi. Sam. Nice to meet you. My question is, you talked about being yourself. I wanted to know, how do you cope with the judging and the rejection that there are always rejection and I wanted to know how do you cope and what It's very you... difficult. I won't make light of it or tell you there are any easy answers. It's hard to feel judged. Um, it's hard to feel like people don't want you or they don't like your output. I think I'm like most authors, you know, very sensitive. Um, and, and to an extent, I've had to grow a thicker skin. I, I've had to be rigorous with myself to say, I, I put that on one side. I accept criticism of my work, fine. Um, I accept constructive criticism, but not kind of hate, hate speech. I don't think it has any place in, I don't want it to have any place in my heart. So I have to also block stuff that I think, I, 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 I'm not going to learn anything. Am I going to learn something from what this person doesn't like about me or not? So I think that's the question you need to ask yourself. And have a bit of self-belief. Because not everyone's going to love you or what you do, but you've got to believe in it. Good luck. Oi. Oi, Lucy. É, é um prazer imenso estar aqui falando com você. É uma energia muito grande. Eu queria te mostrar um desenho que foi feito de, por uma menina de 5 anos. O molde era o seguinte. É, o que, que o universo representa para você? Então, essa menina desenhou esse aqui. Ela tem cinco anos, é uma menina japonesa. Ela tá. É beautiful. Isso aí foi. Uh, yes, and I believe that's my father there in the cartoon. Is that correct? So é, é, yeah. yeah. sim, sim. Yeah, lovely. É, so we've é, got a child's drawing of a scientist, and it's my father. It's colorful. It's got a bird in it. It's got balloons é. in it. It's everything I'm hoping for. É Thank como you. seu pai transforma a vida das pessoas. Que é uma menina de cinco anos e foi exposto na Expo do Pai 2020. Tudo bem. Tá. Thank you. <laughs> Aqui. Som. Oi. Oh, sorry. Boa noite. É, eu sou professora de ciências e trabalho com essa função difícil né, de fazer essa tradução da linguagem científica, pra, acadêmica, para as crianças. Sorry, what's the, what, what's the question? Oh, okay, got it. Essa transposição. E... Eu sinto uma falta imensa. Trabalho com o teu livro desde a primeira edição, com os meus alunos. E não se acha mais para comprar. Não se acha mais para comprar em lugar nenhum. Ok, I'll follow it up. If you have a card, and I will write to you. And... Você tem um cartão, número de telefone. Ela... Ok. And we'll try and find some copies in Brazilian Portuguese. Okay. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Olá, eu sou Oi. Terezinha Souza, sou de Rio Paranaíba, Minas Gerais. Eu sou astrônoma amadora. Ah, e o que eu faço é mostrar o céu. Essa luneta telescópio nós ganhamos da IAU, União Internacional de Astronomia. Um projeto de garotas e garotos estrelas. Nós somos 20 mulheres que fazemos astronomia raiz lá no interior de Minas Gerais, aqui no Brasil. É um prazer ouvir você. Ok. E a gente conta as histórias, as histórias da mitologia, as histórias das estrelas e as histórias do seu pai e as histórias das mulheres na ciência e na astronomia. That's fantastic. That Muito obrigada. Really great work. That's great. Obrigada. No, thank you. That sounds amazing. 
Hello. Here, here. Hi, Lucy. Hi. Um, I must say that I'm really happy to be here today and oh, hear your you. lecture. You're, I'm a big fan of yours. You're a great thank inspiration you. to me. And uh, um, I work as a science communicator here in Brazil. And uh, there are a lot of new science communicators here uh, working to uh, disseminate science. And uh, I would like a device to the new generation of science communicators. And also, I would like you to I sign. I see. Yeah, I will the sign book. it afterwards. <laughs> that, no problem. Thank you. Was there a question? Oh, wait. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Andre. Hi, Andre. So, do you think that if your father had lived longer, he would have found the underlying theory of, of everything? Oh, that is a very interesting question. Um, that was what he most wanted to do. Um, whether he would have found... I think if he had lived maybe another 10 years, then hopefully, but we can't say. It's one of the great unanswered mysteries. However, one thing he was also very keen on was giving inspiration to a future generation of scientists. He didn't believe that everything had to be done by him. So he would be very proud to think that someone inspired by his example would go on to do the work that he didn't have time to complete in his life. Should I take two more? Yeah, a couple more. Oh, hi. Hello. Good evening. Oi. Boa noite. Meu nome é José Rafael. Oi, meu nome é José Rafael. Boa noite. Hi. Estou muito feliz em estar aqui em sua palestra. Logo no primeiro dia que eu soube que você estaria aqui, eu fiquei muito animado para vir. Oh, thank you. Lovely to meet you. So he's doing a project on education and leisure. Alguns livros para nosso projeto. Of course, I'll be happy to. Can I have a word with you afterwards? Is that okay? Should we come and have a chat afterwards? I'll be just over there, and then we can we can exchange ideas. Okay. Okay. Great to meet you. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Do with this two one more. Lucy, here. Hi. On your, your left. Oh, my left. left. Sorry. Left. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Well, my name is Ikaro. Hi. And I am an engineer and physics teacher. I'd, first of all, I would like to say thank you. Oh, thank you. For coming here and talking to us. And I have a question. Recently, we were seeing a growth of some unscientific movements, like you said, the flat earth and etc and i would like to to ask you for some advice uh, what do you think that we as scientists writers teachers uh, what do you think that we can do to fix it because this is not some missing information exactly. we have a lot of information free and online what in what do you, do I, I agree. It's a very, very difficult question. And I actually uh, worked last year with a psychologist who works on the psychology of people who believe in conspiracy theories, because um, I was trying to understand myself. 
So I asked her, what can we do and what in the science engagement community? And she said, it's about more engagement. It's about increasing the level of engagement, increasing the accessibility. And as I was talking, maybe using different techniques, using imagery, using emotion, being clear about what the reality is of the science that we like say in, in terms of climate change talking about what is the impact on everyday impact on people what is the relevance rather than going for the statistics and the abstract concepts so her point was scientists have to make even more of an effort to get out there to talk to people to be inclusive and that in her view that was the only way to break it down because um, there is a specific mindset that goes with conspiracy theories. It's often about exclusion, about social anxiety, about a feeling of belonging, of having special knowledge that other people don't know. And so we can't attack, you know, attacking that only drives people further away because it makes them feel like, oh, I was right, you know, I am excluded, I am not welcome. So we have to go the other way and be as inclusive, as accessible as possible. Great I question. See. I see. Thank you. Huge fan of your work and your dad's Thank work. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. É isso, pessoal. Oi, pessoal. É isso, então. Obrigado. Is that it? Oh, yes. All right. Well, that's, that's the end of my session. But thank you all so much for coming here this evening. It has been really amazing to be part of Campus Party. And I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you for listening. <laughs>